I want to go ahead and, and officially welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining the conversation here today. Um, we are very excited to be joined again by Kurt Hinckley, who I will uh, introduce in just a moment. Um, we are talking about the electric vehicle industry um, and specifically how something called ESG um, is changing the game. Uh, so I was not uh, privy to ESG uh, before we started discussing this with Kurt, and I'm so glad that he brought it to my attention. Um, essentially, as I understand it, uh, it's an investment model that prioritizes the long-term impact of investments on society and the environment at large, uh, in addition to profits. So it's this really exciting trend that we're seeing uh, amongst institutional investors and elsewhere. Um, that really is thinking longer term and has really exciting implications for an industry like electric vehicles, um, which we'll be diving into in more detail in just a moment. Uh, for some quick context on Kurt's background, uh, Kurt is an industry veteran uh, and investor. Uh, so he actually has built an award-winning supplier to Tesla. Um, he has built a startup um, that I believe you're still working on now, Kurt, if I'm not mistaken, with Tesla executives, former Tesla executives, excuse me. Um, he's a consultant and an investor. He does all sorts of things. He really is an expert in this area. So uh, we are very lucky to be here talking with him today. Um, and yeah, before we kick it off, I want to introduce myself because I forgot to do that. <laughs> so I'm Jacob Smith. Um, I'm here representing an awesome company uh, called Ultimetric, uh, which is a uh, technology, um, excuse me, a uh, digital transformation uh, company. So we help clients basically stay ahead of the curve with technology change and surface innovation from within their teams. Um, we, me and my colleague, Ryan Robinson, who's somewhere on this call, uh, some of you may know us, uh, we represent a team called Collider. Uh, that is looking to connect and grow and build uh, the uh, local technology professional uh, ecosystem, the tech, the tech ecosystem. Um, so we encourage everybody to connect with us, stay connected. We're regularly hosting um, programs on a wide range of technical topics um, and really looking to, uh, to help everybody level their game up. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and pass it off to Kurt to kick off the conversation with telling us what exactly is ESG and why should we care about it, Kurt? Absolutely good. Uh, thanks for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, and, and I, I, I think I'll take a step back. We were just speaking about the case, the connectivity for, for EVs. So the, the EVs reside under this, this, this umbrella, this bubble of, of ESG. So the, um, and so where I'll start with is we'll start with the SG and what that umbrella is and then, and then drive that down into the investment side of what that looks like specific to ESG, but also that how that starts to roll into EVs and end on EVs of why that finds its way up the top of this. So, um, so ESG is going to be um, environmental, social, and corporate governance. And so it's kind of the, uh, we used to have CSR, which was, you know, corporate social responsibility which had no criteria and no, it was just a, it was a greenwashing, they call it, right? You can just, yeah, we're doing it. We're taking care of the world. We're taking care of each other. Um, and so people, that, that was kind of the origins of that, but there was no criteria or measuring. And if, as we know, if you can't measure it, you can't change it. So ESG has, has really become the, the thing around those areas. Um, as it relates to investing side of it, then there was something, it's, just, it's still used as sustainable investing. I think that's still a pretty common phrase, but it's really turned all the way over to ESG investing um, because it's the same thing, but ESG is going to encapsulate all of those areas. We have a lot of information around environmental, climate change. We, we, can, we can connect the dots pretty well. There's easier ways to get that data. It's still not perfect. It's still not great even, uh, and companies and, in particular around the world have not had to report much on it. Uh, and so when they do, um, it, again, a lot of it's greenwashing um, in the past. So it, it makes them look good. Everybody says, yeah, we're gonna invest in you because you're into the ESG. Um, so when when you look at the um, I say ESG on, in terms of what the environmental is, just so we're clear, you know, the waste and pollution, resource depletion, greenhouse, climate change, right? Social is going to be the employer relations, diversity, working conditions, health and safety, conflict, anything to do with, with, with people in that. And, and 
and we'll talk in a second of why that one's the next big one. But then the governance one is what I think people don't always know about, which is tax strategy, how much do the executives get paid, political lobbying, corruption and bribery, uh, even to the point of the structure of their board is their diversity on the board. So I think that one was really key to kind of explain today because it's um, it's probably the hardest one to make changes in right now and in some of the areas. And yet it's it's on the radar. And so you've seen a lot more people uh, get, get interested in that to the point of even NASDAQ has asked the SEC uh, Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States to, um, to look at allowing NASDAQ to require every listed company on the NASDAQ to have a diverse board. And so, um, it, and if they don't, then they, they get kicked off the NASDAQ. So that is a big change. And I don't know where the SEC will land on that, but that's the kind of corporate governance feel you're gonna get. And that's, 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 that's a lot different activism than say, the social side of what's going on about uh, gender equality, income equalities, all, all the things um, that, that are around the social side. And then environment is the one that you, you've, you've probably heard around forever, but they've, they've really brought them all together and it's been building over the last you know, 15 years, but especially the last five years, relatively in a linear way, I would say it's certainly been increasing until last year. And last year, um, the because of Jump ahead a little bit, but because of the pandemic, uh, the and because of Black Lives Matter and the inequalities on on income, there were a lot of things that were laid bare that we couldn't. It was, you could just stare at every day because everybody was home staring at them, and so a lot of movement in terms of investing was done. So a lot of millennials, and in particular, were interested sitting at home through Robinhood or, or you know, whoever it was. And they say, we want our money invested in companies that care about these things. And that money flowed like crazy in the first quarter of last year to the point where those companies that were considered ESG companies vastly outperformed all the other companies by something like 20%. It, it, was, it was insane uh, how much, they, I think those companies actually improved in their value of their stocks by 20% when the other ones actually went down a little bit. So. Um, it changed like everybody's attention of wait, wait, this is this this thing really is turning the corner, and the idea of that that it wasn't going to go away, right? It it this has now become an exponential change, to the point where by by twenty twenty five, over half of all of the managed funds in the United States will be ESG connected somehow, and so that's that's more than double right now and it's probably quadruple from two years ago so it's great that's wonderful the challenge is we have this really big problem with data <laughs> so, and nobody it's it, you can tell everybody you're doing something and so now that's where a lot of the attention is um is in that in the area we'll get into that but the um uh, i think you know if you look at it's, it's important to note that 70 percent of all of the share or all of the the, the all of the companies, um, the shares are owned by institutional investors or managed by institutional investors. Uh, and that includes private equity. So think pension funds, that kind of thing. Um, so they're really controlling where that goes. Are they interested? Yeah, they're massively interested now because they know one, they have all these people with this money that only want to invest in ESG companies. So they're re they really need to force the issue so they can provide funds that you and I might want to invest in. And so there aren't a lot of those out there that are really proven that that's, that that's what they're doing. Um, so they, and they also know um, in, in, from a different angle that climate change in particular, but also a happy, healthy workforce that's diverse, et cetera, is going to make a more sustainable, profitable company. And it, it's never more true than now. So, and, and there's tons of bankers and everybody else that's reported on that in the last six months. We need to find those companies. We need to build those companies and support those companies. And, um, so yeah, money drives it. I, I, I get that, right? So it's so people say, is this all for the right reasons? Um, I don't know, does it matter, right? <laughs> so, um, it's, it's happening. And so we're, we're seeing that, that shift and, and, and there's, in the past, there, wasn't, there weren't as good returns on it. So now there are, we're seeing better returns than even the regular ones, uh, regular funds. So Wanted to get into that and on ESG side, so you understand that's the whole umbrella. So everything that's happening around EVs or solar panels or anything else all fall under that umbrella. 
So that and, and so when we drive down to EVs, we're gonna we're gonna veer off from solar panels and we're gonna veer off from hydro and, and all of that. But they all fall under the same thing, and, and there's so many other areas as well. Um, I think one other big, big piece of information that 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 really underpins all of this is um, Milton Friedman back in 1970. See if I have the actual quote here. Um, so yeah, I have it somewhere, but don't know where I put it. Milton Friedman, 1970, thought of Chicago, though, said it's foolhardy to actually try to change society, basically, through investments, through board action, through companies. Um, the most important thing is shareholder value. That, when he came out and said that, that is what's been used to build what the SEC now has as their model, their mantra, it's their, um, their, their requirement that everything has to be aimed at the shareholder value. And the difference to that is, is it's not stakeholder. We're all stakeholders. If you're at any point, you could argue we're all stakeholders who live on, on the earth. But if you invest in it, if you're a supplier, if you're an employee, if those are stakeholders as well as the shareholders. Um, so in the United States, the SEC still controls it and everything has to just flow through to the shareholders. So it's been more difficult here. In Europe, it's all stakeholder based. So the new rules, and, and it's been like that for a while, but it's really kicked in now. So stakeholders in Europe are the ones, if, if, if you can't show what you're doing as a stakeholder, then the regulations will force you, uh, or as a, as a company for the stakeholders, the, the regulations will force you to take care of and consider everybody that it'll have an impact on no matter what you do, which then flows through to ESG, right? So um, in the United States, the the money's flowing, and obviously with Biden in now, that, that makes all of this more, um, more doable. Uh, there's an opening for, well, that's why NASDAQ waited to talk to the SEC until after Biden got elected. Um, and, you know, we'll see that change as, as the SEC gets their, gets, gets their, get their hands free to maybe make some of these changes to stakeholders. Um, but at the end of the day, we get back to investment, you follow the money on this one. Europe's not following the money, they're following climate change. In the United States, I'm not saying that about us, but I'm saying it about the investment side. They're, they're doing it for the money, which is also ends up being the same end result, right? Um, so that's what's driving it faster here in the United States than Europe is, is just that investment group. Um, so now finally, we're starting to see some overlap of rules, regulations. How do we know if something's being done? So um, that that has really taken off uh, quite a bit. So I'll stop right there because there's this is something you can dive into at, at, from an Asia perspective, European, United States, and see where it's all going. But what I really wanted to get you the idea is that this is the overarching umbrella that really covers all of what, well, pretty much of all of the investment that's going on now. And most of everything you read falls into something under that category, which is totally different. It's really cool. But I think if you see it through that lens, you're going to see opportunities differently. And you're going to, it's, it, there's some companies that, that look great, but aren't, and you start to ask those questions. So I'll just throw that out to you. If anybody has anything else they want to know about that before we kind of uh, dive in a little bit more on it, but um, yeah. yeah. We encourage everybody to, to drop questions in the chat as well. Um, and while they're doing that, Kurt, I'm curious if you could elaborate a bit on just for, for folks tuning in who aren't institutional investors, who maybe are stakeholders um, either working in the EV industry or just interested in the future of EVs and how they can uh, take advantage of these exciting trends. Um, what might you tell tell uh, tell those folks? Yeah, so so what's happening in terms of investment side is um, there's there's a dearth of companies that are considered really truly ESG companies that that investment companies want to have in their portfolios, or you and I can invest in just individually, like a Tesla Motors. What's interesting to me is that there's certain types of companies that get a free pass. Um, and I, I get it for the most part, but if you're an EV company, you're automatically checking all the boxes in the, as an ESG company. So you, you get that. If you're a solar panel company, you check all the boxes, right? So there aren't that many EV companies and there aren't that many solar companies. And you go through kind of that list. What that means is there's a lot of money chasing a small number of companies. And what that means is you see Tesla's stock price go through the roof. So you start thinking of like, that's where you see all these other EV companies that are going public without even making a vehicle yet through these special purpose acquisition companies, right? 
that's why they're doing it because there's a lot of money sitting there waiting on the sideline to say, we need to be able to make these funds that hold these companies, but there aren't enough companies. So if you're investing, if you're looking for um, a, something to, to invest in medium term to short term, those are great places to go. I think the long term problem, of course, is not all of them are going to make it. <laughs> so, you know, which ones and they'll start to see over the next two to three years more companies that can really prove their ESG companies. And that'll be led, though, by how many more are really needed in terms of those companies. So it, if, if you keep an eye on this ESG space, any company that says that they're going to be involved, that they really can prove they're, they're following through, their stock price is going to go up simply because there's a lot of money chasing a small number of companies. That is a great opportunity for anyone here to, to invest. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of opposite um, the Warren Buffett in a sense, you know, he's going for the old railroads and things and that stuff's still there, right? I, it's it definitely, that's not going to go away. Um, but uh, in the short and medium term, there's a great opportunity for through the lens of ESG. So if you don't just look at EV and all the pieces that go to EV, right? Batteries, connectivity, autonomous driving, all of those areas are getting just more money than they know what to do with. I mean, Lucid is going public right now at a valuation of $24 billion. <laughs> and I can, I know them really well and they have a really great car and really great technology but it's a lot of money, <laughs> you know, and I, there's so many of those, right. That are, um, that, that, that make nothing yet. And they're worth billions. And so, but yeah. Hey, it's an investment and some of those are going to make it. We won't know for five years, maybe 10. So it's a good short-term way to, to, uh, to get in, in on it. Um, so yeah, it, it, you're not going to go down in value. So they're, they're pretty safe bets, you know, solar panels, you know, as long as you're connecting with one that's has a good story behind it. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think there's some in Europe, if, if you can connect into them, there are um, some great companies in Europe that have to follow through on the CSG stuff. So, you know, that's how I think is the best way to play it as an investor, you know, and, and I think it, and I think everybody that's in the millennial group, you really, this is a great time to you can risk a little bit more. Um, so if you're right four out of the five times, you're going to be doing pretty well. Yeah. Got it. And then uh, we've got a great question from Adam DM in the chat here. Um, and I, and I do want to, uh, he brings up a good point, just kind of where, where do the OEMs fit into this mix? He's specifically asking um, if you have thoughts on the market correction for traditional auto companies who are moving towards EV. Um, so Tesla's market cap versus a company like Ford. Um, and how the market does adapt to the Fords and the GMs uh, going electric. Yeah, so I think, um, I think so, so Kimberly, I think one of the, going to you for a moment, just because um, your husband works at Chrysler, right? So um, Chrysler, the, the way they're doing it with Fiat, and just, they're not quite as far along, so their, their stock price is caught up in that whole merger too. So they're, they're a little bit different, right? But when you look at a Ford, uh, Ford really coming out and, and doubling down on, on in Europe, what is it, by 2025 or 2030, they're going to be all electric in Europe. Um, they're connected with Volkswagen. A lot of the, you know, bring up the Mach-E is, is out coming out right now. Um, so what, what's happened is, to, to, your, to your question, is Ford stock price has gone up, I think it's at 31% um, since in this year alone. Um, I think GM's price, stock price has gone up 20% in this year alone. And so you're seeing that correction happen, but only until um, they, they with, without spinning off those companies, uh, that the pieces of them that are electric or autonomous, um, they're trying to hold on to that and take up the whole company, bring up the whole company with it at this point anyway. Um, so you're starting to see that now. People are giving them credit saying, okay, they're really all in. It isn't just words. They're putting tens of billions of dollars into this. So because of that, their share prices are, are going up accordingly. Um, so yeah, you're seeing that. Now I think it, it, it'll continue to do that as, as that rotation changes, if it's managed well. I think GM and Ford are, GM's probably further ahead on because they're just, they've been in, a, in this longer in this space and they're bigger. Um, Ford's doing a really nice job though by making connections. It's kind of like when the music stops, make sure you have a chair. Um, Ford's figured out how to do that. Um, so you know, yeah, I think they'll, they'll, they'll both do really well. Now, the, of course, the delta between them and Tesla is for a lot of other reasons than just that. So, um, 
you know, Tesla has so many other things that they're doing at the same time, but they're also because of the market and money that's chasing a small number of companies. Uh, there's a lot of pieces. So they, they, they definitely, one could argue they are worth a trillion dollars. One could argue they're worth 200 billion. Um, it's hard to tell based on if you think five years from now, what are they going to be providing to the to, to the marketplace? If they are what they are right now, and that's all they were, then they're probably way overpriced. They certainly, I think, likely are way overpriced right now just based on the monies that are flowing into there from the institutional investment communities and from day traders or Robinhood traders, if you will. It's a great place to put money. And it's unlikely going to go down for a while. So why not put more money into it? And all that does is drive the price up, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and does that come back down to earth? I don't, I don't know. It, it, it wouldn't surprise me if it had a 25% over time fall at some point before it continues back up, depending on what they bring to market, you know, and, and, and even then just as importantly, how fast, uh, how fast other companies catch up with them. And I only mean that in the sense of, um, there's a lot of people that still only want a Ford, not a Tesla. You know, there's only so many people that want a Volkswagen, not a Tesla. And you go through those sorts of pieces of it and you realize that, um, you know, if there's a, they're, they're sort of commodities in a way at this point, EV cars, I mean, they're, they're really great, but they're really getting the most out of them and there's always improvements to be made. So then it comes down to who do you trust more? Who has a better service record? Are you a Ford person? Are you a GM person? Are you whatever, both Volkswagen? Um, and so because of that, it'll, it'll keep Tesla from pulling too far, much more away from the pack as it relates to cars. So that, that will also close that gap on, um, on investment. Again, because there's not a lot of companies too that can say they're ESG and the more Ford and GM pivot towards ESG, it's, it seriously is a big money it shift. And, and so as, as they get more higher marks for ESG, companies add them into an ESG portfolio. So somebody added Ford into a big old portfolio, that's going to drive their price up, just that. So, you know, it, it, it's a group of things that, that will happen. They will happen. Um, whether they'll catch Tesla is an entirely different thing, simply based on Tesla has a lot of other things they're into, right? So, um, I don't know that Ford really wants to do that or GM, but um, yeah. So I hope that answers your question. Um, it is um, Ford and GM, boy, was it six months ago? I there, there were a lot of questions whether they were going to wake up and kind of start chasing it. I, I From being in the industry, I knew that GM in particular had woke up about a year and a half ago, two years ago, and they were really putting a lot into it just from internal work with them. Ford uh, was a little bit behind that certainly and but ended up really getting doing a good job at connecting with partners and they tend because they're family owned in a sense if you will they tend to be better at um i think some of those partnerships um behind the scenes in my opinion watching what they've done yeah so um again chrysler is a different situation i i, I it's hard because they're so interconnected with around the world with different cultures yeah so um we'll see yeah, uh, we'll definitely see on that. So it's a great question. And, and Adam is a, a member of the Altimetra team and a senior engineer at Ford, a uh, oh, project manager. Yeah. So. so do you um, agree? Do you agree or not? <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's from what I'm seeing from the, yeah, from, from out here and the, it's, you know, being in a supply base to companies of like the Ford, I mean, there's some parts that, that we're, I, there's the Maki parts and things. I mean, I, I know them well enough, but we see it from a different angle. You know, we're, we're not inside the cage of Ford or the cage of GM. So um, we kind of get to see what everybody's doing in a little different way. <laughs> so. Yeah, this is Adam. It's just the reason for my question is kind of funny. And it was timely that the Lucid um, deal is going down as we speak, because you'd almost have to look at, well, what if there was a company that just spun off the Mach-E and was going public right now? You know, with the valuation of a company that was making that Mach-E, be in that sort of a range or, in, you know, at being able to make a more affordable car at scale. And then just because it's part of Ford and not spun off as its own startup, Absolutely. you know, the, the market's just not seen it the same way and uh, not valuing Ford, you know, Ford's overall market cap is what under 50 billion mm -hmm. and Lucid's going public right now at 25 without even a car in the road. Um, yeah. You look at Mach-E, we're already delivering that um, to rave reviews, car of the year, or SUV of the year at least. And you know, how the, that has not transitioned into the same kind of market cap increase as you'd see on a startup. 
I just thought it was interesting to get your opinion on how the market then starts to correct as mm -hmm. all these companies are announcing their, their paths towards being fully EV at some point in the near future. Yeah. And I, well, I, it's, 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 it's kind of fun to watch, you know, because it's, if, if Ford didn't have your, if your share price was not, I don't know what it's up today, but it, it was the, the last number I looked at was 30, 35% of first part of, um, of this year, I, I believe. Um, so if that still holds and you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but if there, if that, if your share price was not increasing significantly right now, I'd be concerned and that would definitely be a problem. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, the longer term view is you think over two or three years as the F-150 comes out electric and you start seeing a lot of these other vehicles, um, I think you're just going to see the, a, a reasonable valuation. So instead of, let's say, 150 billion, you, you could easily see 500. I, I, I could see that happening in, in three years or four years. So um, it's just going to take, it's a different path, right? Um, you've got a different investment group too. You got to remember that the investment group across the board who's invested in Ford, they're involved in certain funds. And you think of the institutional investment companies that have Ford in their portfolios, it takes a massive difference in something going on for them to change how much of the Ford stock they have. So it, it, it's, they're kind of stuck, or you're kind of stuck, if you will, on your share price, partly because of that. But once you see that start to free up a little bit and Ford starts to be seen as an EV company more so, you'll see that that, that investment strategy will change and in who's investing into Ford. And so uh, where like a Tesla doesn't have that, they're not, they're not locked down by that sort of thing. Um, so it, there's some market mechanics that have to break first, if that makes sense and to, to really start to unlock that value more. Obviously the other option is you could spin it off, but um, the problem with that is then, it's like, I live in Kalamazoo where Pfizer spun off uh, the animal health stuff at, at one point when it was really just a fork truck going back and forth and it was a brand new company from one side of the building to the other. Um, but they unlocked a huge amount of value. Some, it was some, and I think Pfizer owned, still owned 80%. I think you had to sell 20% into the market or something. But it was automatically worth ten billion dollars, and it was like, what they're just a fork truck going back and forth, <laughs> and it's just and now it's built into this massive company. But the thing is, Pfizer still exists, right? So they're two different companies now. Ford, if they were to spin off their EV, you'd have to argue that that would not be a good idea. <laughs> so you know, in ten years, right? So I think you've got to kind of ride that up. They've got to transition. Where again, Tesla doesn't have to transition. And, but you know, the nice thing is GM's in the same boat, Volkswagen, everybody's in the same boat. Um, and I think you will see a lot of um, um, uh, brand loyalty. I just, I mean, it's just, that's, that's what's gonna happen. And the difference between, like you say, the mach -E's amazing vehicle. Well, now you've got another amazing vehicle versus a Model 3 or whatever you wanna compare it to. That's an amazing vehicle, great. Two amazing vehicles. <laughs> I mean, it, hmm. it's not like there's this massive difference anymore. It just comes down to who's who's why do you buy into? Simon Sinek has a great uh, TED talk about why people don't buy what you make. They don't buy how you do it. They buy why you why you exist. Why you and so that's a great thing to watch. And so you work from why on the way out. And that Tesla really had that nailed down. That was modeled after Apple. And um, so if you get off of the what you make. And you get off of the how you make it, which is important, but you talk about why. And, and I, you really see Ford and GM rotating to that. And, um, and I, think, I think all companies should. I mean, it, it's about who you are and why you exist versus at the end of the day, we just happen to make amazing electric vehicles, right? Or whatever, right? And we also make whatever else you want to say, solar panels and, or GM might, or Ford might make scooters, right? I mean, so you, yeah, it just happens to be what you make. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it, it's, it makes sense why it is where it is right now. If it weren't changing, I, it would just mean the system's broken and it would just take a little while, but it, it almost, it kind of wouldn't make sense. It, it has to change. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah, and we got a, a couple more, uh, great, uh, questions in here. And I, I want to add, um, I think obvious question is a good transition. I want to add to it. So, um, I'm curious to know kind of what, what, makes a company count as an, as an ESG viable uh, investment. Um, so specifically through the lens of a company like Ford, is there like a tipping point when 
you know, when that when that kicks in uh, with with something like Ford. Um, and then Abby's question is specifically um, about regulatory credits that incentivize automakers to sell a certain percentage of EVs. Um, so acknowledging that Tesla makes revenue selling credits to large automakers. Um, do you have insight how smaller electric manufacturers play into that regulatory credit market? Wow. Okay. So, so could you speak to the incentive side of the equation? Yeah. Yeah. So um, on your side on that, you're talking about um, when would Ford, for example, become more of an ESG company? I think it's um, for a company like Ford's going to have a bit more trouble getting there quickly simply because they have these legacy issues and they have a supply base that has legacy issues. Um, so they'll have to prove and show, first of all, it's going to be data collection. And there's a lot of problem with data collection and understanding of whether that data is actually um, uh, useful, right? Is it, is it, there's, there's a lot of data out there, not just for climate, but for, and, and there's more that's coming on the social side, but it's really taking um, third party companies to, to try to tell you how people rate. It's about the only way to do it really right now, uh, as we quickly learn and use AI to, to, to figure out who is actually doing these things. But then you have like Europe where they're forcing you to uh, companies now to say, this is where we are. Here's the data that shows it. And here's where we're going to go to get to the Paris Accord. So if we're not getting to the Paris Accord based on this, we have to tell our shareholders in the world why. I mean, there's some massive show the world what you're doing sort of differences that are going on now. And Ford plays in Europe. So they're going to have to play in that. And that's going to help them. Right. So your your and invest institutional investors have to take that into account in Europe going forward by law. So I it will force those changes. So better data collection, better understanding what that data means, and then being able to say, okay, this company, if they're on the path and showing that improvement, you could easily argue that's a great ESG company. Right. So it it, it it's it's probably how Ford would go about it versus saying there isn't really a finish line unless you're carbon negative, <laughs> you know, so it, it, that's how I would see Ford doing. Um, hmm. So that's, that's that one. I think on the, on the regulatory credits, um, yeah, so, you know, regulations, a lot of people don't like regulations, but I think it's, it's not an all or nothing thing, right? It's, um, without regulations, it'd be crazy out there. We wouldn't be wearing, I mean, there's tons of things, you can use whatever you want. I mean, it's good to wear seatbelts, right? <laughs> um, but, you, they can overreach on regulations as well. I understand that, but I think on on in this particular situation, I I like. Of course, I'm in the field, so I, I like that there's some regulations around this that say we need to get uh, uh, our to have cafe standards and, and and whatnot. But when you talk about the um, um, the regulatory credits, so Tesla has so many, or if you're a, Fer a Fury, not a Faraday, but a Lucid, you're going to have so many and you can sell them back over to all the other companies, right? And so that's a great, and Tesla still does that. It's a great way to make money. Um, it allows other companies to kick the can down the road a little bit. Some of them, I know Fiat's been good at kicking the can down the road without really getting all in. Um, and then you've got, uh, you have people like Ford and GM who I think, you know, they're kind of in the middle. They're going to be able to take care of that themselves. Um, I don't know if I answered that question right. Or, or, or... No, absolutely. And uh, what I was really wondering about is that it's a nice source of revenue, but not a critical source for companies like Tesla. But as larger manufacturers electrify more, is that a vulnerable source of revenue for smaller manufacturers? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, is there a window in 10 years when we have large companies who've made the transition and all of a sudden these smaller companies. And I agree with you with the incentive aspect, you know, I do see them potentially being phased out, but let's play, play it out and say they're in place for the next 10, 15 years. Do you see that as, um, I don't even know if that's a meaningful source of revenue for these smaller guys. And if so, is it something that might be vulnerable to, uh, uh, you know, not be able to rely on? Yeah, you know, and, and I think it's, it's the, to compare, that to say a $7,500 tax credit that the, that the government might give, right? So that's something that I think is, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be there for a certain amount of vehicles until they get to what, 200,000 in vehicles per company. And then that might even be raised and they're talking about that. So on, I know that's not what you're talking about, but it's a, it's a, that one they can count on, right? I think that's really important to, for smaller companies to count on. Um, my guess is if I'm lucid, I'm not counting on anything after if I'm counting anything at all, three years, maybe, 
I, oh, wow, that's a lot shorter horizon than I would have guessed. But yeah, uh, I just don't see. Um, um, I know some people are lucid. I don't think that's a huge part. I mean, three to five years is a long time, right? So I mean, it, it it's it definitely gets them somewhere. But I don't think that's that's a big part of like Tesla was in so early on it that there was nobody else really providing credits at the level they could. So, and and if you think of the the just the total number of credits that Tesla was able to produce because of the number of vehicles, um, that's kind of hard to get to with some of these smaller companies as well. And I, it, in, again, this is against the backdrop of these companies have gone public, right, through these SPACs. And they are worth a lot of money where, first of all, it does put a lot of money in their coffers, but the market movers for them have to be, have to be bigger than some of this, which is kind of small money, you know, at the end of the day, it wasn't for Tesla. Um, but I think they, I think they have other ways that they're going to stay, um, um, have enough cash flow, right? <laughs> uh, this was all about a cash flow thing for Tesla and it was great, but, um, yeah, that's, that's how I would, that's how I would look at it. And the people at Lucid, I, I, it's a part of what they're looking at, but not, not, they're not looking long-term. I just know Lucid. So I, I, I in the, because they're going public what today or within the first quarter or something. Yeah. So, um. They do have a pretty well developed car. Um, it's fast, <laughs> so um, good stuff. Um, That's cool. So, another great question here, Kurt. Unless you wanted to add to that, sorry. No, it's good. I, I was just reading it. Our link to battery yeah. life. Okay. Yeah. I, so, so great question. I guess. Um, yeah. While we're discussing kind of exciting trends in the industry here, um, you know, the, the question is, uh, you know, do you see a, a future where the battery um, in, in the car becomes the equivalent of the, of the chipset in the, in the computer, especially with these software upgrades and everything that we're seeing now with electric vehicles. Um, I, 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 I do. I, I think what's going to happen, let's say 20 years from now, uh, outside of the, the brand, people connecting to brands, they're all going to say, let's go crazy. Let's say 50 years from now. I mean, electric vehicles are going to be a commodity. I mean, it's gonna start there. It's kind of using first principles and saying, well, where do we want to get to? I mean, at some point, um, it's just, they're just the computer on wheels, you know, everybody just, it's, it's gonna to, going to be more about what type of connectivity, what type of shared, what type of, what other things do you bring into that vehicle that makes it more compelling? Um, and because of all of that, especially the shared side, um, we're going to have far fewer cars. <laughs> so it changes the downtown landscapes, you know, so you're going to talk, we don't need as many uh, parking spots. We don't, I, it, it changes so much that if you look out 50 years, even in 30, and then you can even say 20, it really is going to have a massive change. So bringing that back to battery life then. Um, battery life's just one of the, it's kind of like, as Elon would do with first principles, is where do we want to go to work our way back? And that's why he's talking about this fleet of autonomous vehicles that, you know, he he does that first principles. This is where we're going. And then, so when you're talking about battery life, to me, it's it's bringing it all the way back to about where we are now for, for the next 10 years. Um, there's just this bridge to get over. Instead of just pushing forward by reasoning, by analogy, this is better. We can always make it a little bit better. That's just how most people operate. Um, when you look at, at, at batteries like QuantumScape, which is where the, uh, I think it's Bill Gates is invested in. I don't know if Buffett's in that one, um, but they went public via SPAC. They, um, they have the ability to, to make a solid state. So the, the liquid's not in there, safer, fat, way safer, but it's also much faster charging. And so you look, there's other companies out there too that we know will get to the holy grail of a solid state battery. That battery can charge so much more quickly. It's, it's like, pouring a bucket into a bucket of water and instead of taking a bucket of water and pouring it into a funnel. And you can just boosh, the whole thing just charges. You don't have any problems and away you go. I mean, it is, and you, so you have a smaller amount of batteries you can put anywhere in the car. There's no safety issues. You, you know, it, it just, it, it almost makes the battery conversations we're having right now for this decade and into the next decade, it becomes a moot point. <laughs> It's just that at some point, somebody, it takes so much to build these battery factories. And they're certainly building them so that they can change them into solid state um, at some point. And I know the one in Gigafactory and Tesla is made that way. Um, so you can just change some of the chemistries. But um, at the end of the day, the batteries are, are 
there will come a point when that's again not what drives this this industry you know it's just there's a battery there's going to be a good enough battery right and then you can just use fewer batteries in a car keep the cost of the vehicle down um, the connectivity is going to be more important and and how the shared vehicle works how comfortable it is what are you trying to do with it um, but right now it's it's all about battery and range it, although one could argue we're almost to the point where that it, it isn't that important almost already where five years ago it was right to even get to 300 miles and a charge. Um, now you can, yeah, there's companies that can do that pretty easily. Well, pretty much all of them. Yeah. So that's a big change. <laughs> that's a, just a massive change. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll see where that, where that goes, but yeah, that, that's, that should be where, where it ends up in, in 10 years or more, but yeah, we'll all see it. It's, 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 it's changing that fast. Yeah. That quantum scapes a massive one. It's uh, one of the guys on the board is the, one of the founders of Tesla, J.B. Straubel, he's brilliant. Um, and he's a lot of the brains behind the batteries out in Tesla. Um, so he's he started Redwood Manufacturing or Recycling out in um, uh, Utah, I think it is. Uh, so uh, uh, used batteries are now sent there. So he, he recycles those from Teslas, from, um, from phones, whatever, as a way. And he, it's, it's a very large company, extremely well-funded. He could fund it himself, but um, so it's that whole full circle end of life. What do you do with batteries too? So we're starting to see that as well, but just, just as a side note. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So. Who did that answer your question? Yep. You muted. Yes, thank you. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. absolutely. Uh, it's a great investment opportunity. Don't get me wrong. Cause it's, you know, it, it's changing so quickly and it's a, you know, without change, there's no opportunity, uh, you know, and that's uh, what the CEO of Pepsi or Coke, I think it originally came from a Quaker way back in the day, but without change, there's no opportunity. And there's so much change going on, which equals so much opportunity. Uh, some people don't like that, right? And some people want to drive out variation there. That's a different mindset, but that's where th th this is like the, the, the golden, these are the golden days of investing in EV. I mean, it's just, it, it's going to stop changing as quickly in five years, 10 years, right? It's, it's, so this is which company do you want to put your chips on? You can probably put them on 10 from all the way through the supply chain and you'll probably win on seven of them. You lose on three, but you know, you, it, it's, there is a lot that's going to be needed and uh, there's so much change going on. Yeah. It's, it's exciting. Is Adam, I, I see some interesting parallels in what we're doing with and where we're seeing EVs go with the way that cell phones were the last six, seven years. You know, screen sizes were going up and processors and RAM were going up until it got to a point where now that's just a given. You're going to have a fast machine with a five inch screen. And now you're just looking at the connectivity, how it fits in your lifestyle and everything else that goes on. It's a beautiful way to put it, Adam. I love that. And it's um, one of the companies I'm working with now. It's a, um, it's a manufacturing system that goes on the plant floor. Um, but it's an operating system, you know, and it basically the phone becomes just an operating system. You have inputs too, and you, you, you pay for the inputs and you pay for the outputs, whatever. Um, but the, the vehicle becomes just an operating system <laughs> at the end of the day. And, and that's, you're right. That's, that's where it's headed. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you can go faster than three seconds and zero to 60. Right. And it, 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 all of the things that mattered five years ago in electric vehicle, just there, there's so many of those things that, that don't matter now. The, the the compelling parts are still. It needs to be something where we are right. That, that that we believe in. That we believe in that product. We're comfortable. I mean, it's it's a brand thing. But yeah, it uh, it the the batteries and and the connectivity even it it's it's not new anymore. Which sounds crazy, but <laughs> it's uh, it, it's a given. You have to have over the air updates. You have to have at least 300 miles of range or whatever it might be. And you have to have a certain amount of torque. Um, yeah, after that, what's the, what's the point? And, and Elon said that early on. He said, we'll just get to a point where it, why would you care about going faster? Of course, you made a faster vehicle every time, but um, yeah, it's, that's definitely where it's headed. And it's, we're, we're closer to the end of that, I would say, than, than we're not even in the middle of that, in my opinion, because I've seen you think about where it started 10 years ago when I started getting into this, where it is now. I mean, we're way past the center point on this. So um, that's yeah. amazing. 
It is. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're packing in tight with the lunch hour here. So I want to be respectful oh. of everybody's schedules. Um, when we set out to, to um, kind of first start brainstorming these sessions with Kurt, uh, there are a million different directions we can take this. Kurt has a very wide range of, of knowledge on the industry and trends and, and different directions that um, that the EV industry is heading and, and where batteries are going and all these different things. So uh, we really want to hear from everybody. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Ryan to close us out, but uh, she just dropped a link in the chat here. Um, we'd, we'd love to hear from everybody. Great. Yes, definitely. Everybody, uh, if you have something that you'd like me to, to dive into or uh, in, in a call like this, or if you have something that you particularly want to talk individually, if somebody needs just some input or, you know, it's fun for you, <laughs> um, it's enjoyable for me as well. So certainly reach out if you feel that's something you want to do. Yeah. Thank you for having me today. It was great. I love the, the, the questions and uh, this is just, this is a ton of fun for me. So appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. Um, I did drop a link in the chat for the post event survey that is conc that concludes our discussion on ESG and the EV industry. Um, clearly, there's still a lot to uncover. So I hope that everyone continues to tune in as we slowly but surely unpack this <laughs> extremely relevant topic. Um, so again, thank you, Kurt. We appreciate you sharing. Yeah all of your awesome expertise and knowledge or we will be posting this video on our youtube channel so we strongly encourage everyone to follow us um, at collider detroit on youtube um, you can connect with us tune in for more events in the future um, and again thank you for filling out the post event survey and we hope that you all have an awesome afternoon thanks for tuning in Kurt, is there a good way for people to get in touch with you as well uh, you know what? It's probably the easiest one of all is just Kurt Hinkley 314. I'm a mathematician. So Kurt Hinkley 314 at gmail.com. Um, so if that's the easiest way, I think, because then it, it, they have other emails, but that one's, uh, I think, relatively easy to remember. So excellent. Let's do this again soon, everybody. Sounds good.